Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you may be. I am Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University. And it's really a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome uh, my great friend, uh, Suzanne Goldberg and colleague and Kendall Thomas and Jack Halberstam, um, all beaming from Columbia University uh, all over the world. Uh, Jack is in California, Kendall and Suzanne are in New York and I am here in Jordan. Um, it's really wonderful to have this event and to have it on the last day of Pride Month, on June 30th. Pride Month, of course, is commemoration of the 1969 uh, Stonewall um, riots. And this event really comes only about a week um, since a Supreme Court uh, landmark uh, ruling. Uh, in the past year, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled sometimes in surprising and other times in not so surprising ways. Uh, and on June 15th, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Bostock versus Clayton County uh, was one that did surprise uh, by a vote of six to three with the conservative justice Neil Gorsuch writing for the majority the Supreme Court ruled that the anti-discrimination workplace protection of the 1964 Civil Rights Act applied to the LGBT plus Q plus community. Today, we'll be discussing the ruling's impact, both in America and across the globe, and we will branch from uh, outside of the Supreme Court and the legal dimensions of it uh, to talk about the overall, the overall arc of social change movements, particularly for LGBTQ plus individuals um, around the world. Moderating the panel with me, I'm pleased to introduce Suzanne Goldberg, who is Executive Vice President of Columbia University Life. Um, a leading expert in sexuality and gender law. Uh, Suzanne is the Herbert and Doris Wexler Clinical Professor of Law. She's the founder and director of the Sexuality and Gender Law Clinic at Columbia, and she's co-director of the Center for Gender and Sec Sexuality Law at Columbia Law School, where she has been on the faculty since 2006. Kendall Thomas is the Nash Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Uh, Kendall is a scholar of comparative constitutional law and human rights whose teaching and research focus on legal philosophy, feminist legal theory, and law and sexuality. Kendall has been chair of the jurisprudence section and the law and humanities section of the Association of American Law School, and he has written widely about the impact of AIDS on our society. Jack Halberstam is the director of the Institute for Research on Women, Gender and Sexuality and professor of gender studies and English at Columbia University, author of five books, including Skin Shows, Gothic Horror and the Technology of Monsters, Female Masculinity in a Queer Time and Place, The Queer Art of Failure and Gaga Feminism, Sex, Gender and the End of Normal. Thank you for being here, Kendall, Jack and Suzanne. Uh, so to get started, um, and first of all, we're going to do this quite informally and have a conversation amongst the um, four of us, uh, and Suzanne will help, um, will, will co-host uh, this event with me. And my first question is to you, Suzanne, and then maybe you can take it from there. And that is, how will this Supreme Court ruling in practice offer protection to members of the LGBTQ plus community? Uh, i.e., you know, what is the potential refusal of medical services and treatment, access to social security, survivor's pension, and financial assistance to carers? How will those things change? Uh, what is the uh, practical promise and limits of the Supreme Court ruling? Over to you, Suzanne. Thanks. Thanks so much, Safwan. I'm so glad to be here. And I also want to thank the team at the Columbia Global Centers for hosting this forum and allowing University Life to join you in hosting it. This is incredibly important conversation. We have wonderful colleagues in Kendall and Jack here with us for this discussion. Uh, you can imagine it to be a sort of quasi dinner party or brunch, depending on where in the world you are when you're watching this. Um, but imagine this as a conversation with all of us around, around the table. Uh, so looking specifically to the question of this in, important Supreme Court ruling, um, I'll, I'll just note three different aspects of it 
there's the practical aspect of it, there's the promise of it, and then there are the limits of it. And we'll explore this much more deeply in the course of the conversation. The practical aspect of the ruling um, is this. Before the Supreme Court's ruling, more than half of the states in the United States offered no pr protection against employment discrimination to people who are fired for being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. After this ruling, we have federal, meaning across the United States, protection under one of our most important civil rights laws, recognizing that if somebody is fired or otherwise discriminated against or harassed at work for being LGBT, LGBT they have a legal remedy. They can bring a claim, they can go to court. Now, most people, of course, don't go to court when they're discriminated against, uh, but this does provide an opening for a conversation and it provides, uh, puts employers on notice that if they don't provide meaningful protections to their LGBT employees, they're at risk of serious liability. The, prom the, the promise of the opinion is even greater than its practical effect in some ways. And that is that it is a decision that recognizes that discrimination against LGBT people is a form of sex discrimination. That's important because this ruling and this analysis can then carry over and challenge forms of sex discrimination and sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination that exist across the federal landscape and state landscape, uh, including many changes that the current Trump administration has put in with respect to healthcare access, among many other things. And we can talk some more about that. The, the, um, there's another aspect of the promise that I, I just want to underscore by reading a line from the decision, really two sentences. And that is, this is the first time the US Supreme Court has ever issued a fully positive ruling recognizing the humanity of transgender individuals in addition to providing legal protection. And there's a simple sentence which says, or take an employer who fires a transgender person who was identified as male at birth, but who now identifies as female. And in that sentence, the court expresses an understanding of gender and gender identity that we've never seen before. And I think in that is the promise of a recognition of full humanity of uh, transgender people that is just critically important and gives us the foundation for so much more. There's a lot more to be said, but Kendall, let me turn it over to you and ask you in essence what, what, uh, what Safwan just asked me about the significance of this decision. But I also want to ask you in, in, in a particular way, which is that some years ago when the US Supreme Court recognized marriage equality for same-sex couples, some were saying, well, the fight for LGBTQ rights in America was won. Now we know it hasn't been won and it hasn't even been won with this decision, but, but I wonder if you could say a bit about why this ruling on anti-discrimination is so important and also on, on what you see as lying ahead. Thank you, Suzanne. And let me begin uh, before I tackle that question by thanking the Columbia Global Centers and Safwan and all his colleagues who have made this conversation possible. It's um, a real honor uh, since I consider myself and have long considered myself uh, a member and um, part of the team of the Columbia Global Centers. Um, Suzanne, the question is a, is a difficult one uh, because a, as you know, um, I have always thought that of all the issues uh, aside from the criminalization of consensual sexual intimacy uh, that LGBTQ people face, the question of discrimination in the workplace is the most important. Uh, this question uh, of economic justice is always, uh, for those of us um, who have been activists uh, and not as committed as some other segments of the community uh, have been to um, getting into the military or getting married. This question of economic justice in the workplace has always been a central one. Uh, so my position is uh, that I'm glad the court decided these two cases the way that the court decided them. Uh, I am um, pleased that we won't have to fight this particular battle at the federal level anymore. Uh, the 
the 50% of the states that did not have laws uh, will now have to comply with this federal law, which of course takes supremacy over state law in this area. Uh, that said, uh, and one, one other point I want to make uh, about the opinion itself, in some of the press, uh, the, the Bostic opinion has been talked about as though it were a constitutional opinion, and it's not. Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act is a statute, and it gives statutory protection. And although it's unlikely to happen, uh, if we had a majority in the Senate and a majority in the House of Representatives, which decided tomorrow to repeal the 1964 Civil Rights Act or to amend it to make clear uh, that discrimination on the basis of sexuality or sexual orientation is not prohibited, we'd be back legally uh, to the situation that we were before the court decided this case. So I think it's very important to point out that this was not a constitutional decision like the marriage equality decision or like uh, the decision striking down uh, uh, anti-sodomy law, so-called anti-sodomy law. Um, but I do think that for me, Bostic is a necessary but not sufficient step on the road to full economic justice for LGBTQ folks. Um, it's important to note that 22% of LGBTQ people in this country live in poverty. And uh, that, I'm sorry, 13.9% uh, live in poverty. Uh, no, 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 I, I'm sorry, 22%, I'm, I'm juggling facts, 22% of LGBTQ people live in poverty, which is comparable, uh, I should note, to the rate of poverty among African Americans, which is 27.4%, uh, Latinos, 26.6%, uh, whites, on, on the other hand, only 9.9% .9 of white Americans live in poverty. So these economic justice issues I think are now clearly on the agenda in a way that was not the case, say, with the uh, important decision in 2013 by the Supreme Court in the Windsor case, um, which uh, was a case that had to do with discrimination on the basis of uh, sexual orientation with respect to our tax and inheritance law. So on the whole, um, I think this, this uh, decision is, as you put it, um, a frame for further work. Thanks so much, Kendall. Um, and it, sure, it, it is a frame, and there are very important and interesting questions about what all of this further work will look like. Uh, so with that, Jack, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you and ask you your thoughts on that further work in this moment where we are enmeshed, or parts of the U.S. are enmeshed in in protest, in recognition of tremendous disparities across many groups, certainly across African Americans and Black communities in the U.S., but really um, uh, what COVID has laid bare in terms of the deep challenges to us as a society, society in achieving our, our greater aspirations toward justice and toward opportunity. Um, so from where you sit, a, a, a leading thinker and writer on queer theory and, and much else, um, what do you, how do you see the challenges that remain, where we are in this moment, what, what the next steps might be? Thanks, uh, Suzanne. I think, you know, let me be the, the downer uh, person on the uh, panel. I'm sure uh, uh, Kendall will join me in a moment, but I guess I want to talk about the, the limits of legal reform. Uh, in the sense that, you know, a lot of the, the fighting on the Supreme Court about this decision had to do with what was the intention of the original 1964 decision when the word sex was used, did it mean sexual orientation and did it mean transgender identity? And of course, the conservative uh, judges say that it did not. And Gorsuch decided that he was going to go... Um, uh, along the lines that this was the original intention or it could be read into the decision and therefore um, we can now instate uh, these protections. Um, 
but um, I think that there are, you know, if you actually look at the history of the 1964 Act and the Seventh Amendment, the Seventh Amendment was put in, apparently, by Howard Smith in the hopes of killing the bill. He thought that if sex was added, that this would make it an unattractive, uh, uh, you know, proposition, and it would uh, it would kill the bill. So I think um, we should, you know, think about what some of the limits are. And the limits of this particular ruling are that it might orient towards a fantasy of a sort of neutral relationship. Uh, to the law, and some people are even saying that this ruling, as as progressive as it may seem, could set the stage for a later ruling against affirmative action decisions. And that's often what happens with legal reform: is that the law giveth and the law taketh away, and you have to be wary of what looks like an opening to liberation, but is in fact the the um, installation of new mechanisms for orienting towards individual freedoms and away from uh, collective protection. That's what I believe is happening. I think that pe the fact that people are so surprised by this ruling should be a red flag, should be an alarm bell. It doesn't seem surprising when you consider that in affirmative action decisions, this particular ruling can be used to say that the law should treat everyone on an individual basis and no, no preference should be given either to people of color or to white people in the eye of the law. So I personally think that the celebration is premature. Mm. Mm. So let me maybe try to um, uh, steer us perhaps beyond the United States, right? And beyond the Supreme Court ruling and, uh, to Jack's point that the celebration may be premature, of course, for uh, those of us outside of the United States currently, it's a huge thing. And uh, so many people, I mean, as I said, I'm telecasting from Jordan. I'm in a region, like many regions of the world, perhaps all regions of the world, with the exception of North America and Europe, uh, where there continues to be tremendous prejudice and very little pride that is shared outside of the community of uh, LGBT um, individuals. And, you know, my question is actually, you know, it has many um, dimensions to it. First and foremost, um, do you think that this provides perhaps um, inspiration to movements that are percolating in many parts of the world under the surface? Uh, to advance the legal status and legal protection for LGBT individuals. Kendall, I know uh, you've worked in Brazil. You and I actually met for the first time in uh, Rio de Janeiro at the Global Center there. Um, I have written and done a lot of work on Tunisia, which uh, was the only country to emerge out of the Arab Spring as um, a democracy and introduced a constitution that is unique in the Arab world in that Article 6 of that constitution uh, protects individuals uh, with freedom of conscience, freedom of conscience. Yet, Tunisia continues to have a penal code that punishes homosexuality with up to um, a three-year uh, prison term, and it is being challenged on its um, unconstitutionality. Uh, so I'd love to get, you know, your... Uh, the reactions to one, uh, what the impact of this might or might not be on other parts of the world. And a second part to this is the social change movements that are taking place in uh, the United States. When you look at the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, it has resonated around the world. You know, you've had protests in London and in Paris and in Sydney um, and uh, in various parts of the world. Um, with the with, uh, with the LGBT social change movement, what can you say about its collaboration, if you will, with movements around the world and the help that it can lend itself? And to what extent do you think that that can sometimes hurt the cause? So for example, in Tunisia, going back to that country for a second, uh, the new president of Tunisia insists that uh, everything that has to do with trying to advance LGBT rights in Tunisia is because of foreign influence and immediately making it have a foreign agenda. So Kendall, I'll turn to you. Uh, 
uh, first with those questions? Uh, those are two uh, important and very difficult questions. I'm going to have a hard time uh, answering them uh, succinctly. But I will say um, to the first question that I find it curious uh, that people in other parts of the world look to the United States uh, and to the legal reforms that we have achieved with respect to LGBTQ rights uh, as though we were in the vanguard on many of these issues. So for example, just to take the case of marriage, there were several countries which legalized marriage, uh, same-sex marriage and marriage equality before the United States did. Um, similarly, uh, there are a number of countries which have had anti-discrimination protections in their law uh, uh, from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and transgender identity before the United States. Brazil, for example, um, last year, in an opinion by the Brazilian Supreme Court, held that indeed discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation was prohibited by that country's anti-discrimination law. So for me, uh, the crucial question, and this is always uh, for me the central question, uh, has to do with the ways in which um, there's a tension between the law and the books and people's lived reality of law. And uh, I would suggest that we in the United States ought to be looking to the experience of other countries uh, now that we have finally um, caught up uh, with several countries in the so-called um, developed or developing worlds uh, in according protections judicially um, at the federal level from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And on your second question, um, I watched yesterday the really rich discussion that you had um, uh, with um, my colleagues, uh, Farah Griffin and Jelani Cobb yesterday uh, about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, here again, uh, I would say uh, that there is a long tradition in many places around the world of organizing and activism by um, gay lesbian uh, activists and by transgender activists. Uh, and what I worry about um, is what some folks have called uh, queer imperialism. That is the imposition by Americans of our ways of thinking and talking about sexual orientation identity and transgender identity on the very different uh, cultural and uh, social um, um, realities of other countries. So mm -hmm. I would make a plea um, mm -hmm. for a certain modesty on the part of those of us who are activists in America and I would uh, also make a plea for greater confidence uh, mm. among our, our colleagues who are doing this work in other countries. We all have a lot to learn from one another. Uh, and I think in building a queer civil society, if you will, uh, the networks of uh, collaboration and uh, 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 co-education uh, have to be global. Uh, right. We have things to teach colleagues in other parts of the world, but they most emphatically uh, have things to teach us. I was uh, in a conversation just last year in Brazil, in Rio, at the public ministry, um, a panel of transgender activists who were invited by a federal prosecutor to present uh, to federal employees a seminar on the lives of trans Brazilians. I have a hard time imagining such a thing happening, at least uh, under, uh, uh, in the current administration in our national government. So um, I really want uh, to stress uh, the importance 
of modesty on our part uh, and, uh, if you will, of pride and um, um, greater boldness on the part of our colleagues elsewhere in um, collaborating uh, rather than our importing our way of thinking and doing things to other parts of the world. That's really, really important, uh, Kendall. I'm really happy to hear you say that. At the same time, uh, I can totally appreciate how uh, the rest of the world, if you will, is, you know, is, is in search of models, if you will. And I agree with you that there is no one model, there is no one size that fits all. Uh, there has to be great sensitivity to local uh, realities and to local um, environments and uh, the best kind of models are the ones that are organic and homegrown. So let me turn with that uh, to you, Suzanne. I mean, you know, you've had conversations around the world about this and you and I uh, traveled together um, in Jordan and you met with some gay activists. I know you've uh, also met with some gay activists elsewhere um, in the region. To, to Kendall's point, uh, did, you know, what did you learn about the activism uh, that is taking place in other parts of the world that has informed uh, your own activism um, in the United States? And while you ponder your answer to that, I just want to remind our audience um, to please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask our panelists any questions that you might have, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible um, in the latter part of this uh, webinar. Suzanne? Um, th thanks for the question, Safwan. And, and I, I, I th think I, I'll start by underscoring something that both you and Kendall said, which is that um, we all have a lot to learn from each other. And to me, um, you know, we make a mistake. I think in a sense, it's advocacy malpractice as a lawyer in, a, in some sense if we don't do all we can to learn from people who are doing similar work elsewhere, people who are doing work that looks different, but to similar ends of justice and equality, either in the LGBTQ plus movement or in other social movements, and also to learn from those who are coming up against us, right? What, what is it that is at the core of their concern or their opposition? And so, <clears throat> you know, when we just to, when we look around the world at the status of LGBTQ plus people, uh, it's a pretty mixed bag, um, whether, and both within countries and then around the world. I mean, certainly within the United States, we know that violence against transgender people and transgender people of color, transgender women of color is, is sort of astronomically high relative to most other forms of bias violence. We know that um, when we look, you know, that, that there are a number of countries, not a small number of countries, in which people can be killed uh, lawfully uh, for engaging in same-sex sexual uh, intimacy or for what is sometimes called cross-dressing or presenting as the other sex. And so from my vantage point, um, certainly thinking about law reform, uh, it's critically important to think about law as a tool in bringing us toward greater justice. I agree with something Jack said earlier, which is it, that it can erect barriers as well. And uh, would highlight Kendall's point too, that law doesn't never will map on exactly to lived experience, right? It's a set of frameworks. But yeah. law is an important signal. And it's an important signal, and not only to lawmakers, but to the people or people living in, in a society. So that if there is law that forbids homosexuality in some sense or forbids transgender people from living openly as transgender in some sense, that law affects directly the lives of those individuals to the extent they are legally at risk of, of, of being detained, incarcerated, possibly killed. But it also sends a signal to everybody in the community, right? To families, to employers, to, to people running movie theaters who don't wanna let LGBT mm. people in. That 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 that's the, that that's acceptable. Right. One of the critical efforts, I think, of legal advocates is to shift that boundary and to say, no, that's actually not acceptable. It can take a lot of different forms. We can use a lot of different language, but at least from my point of view, it's work that is very important to do uh, in what in the forms that make sense in a given place. Mm. So, Jack, do you agree? I mean, you, you said earlier, the law, give, the law giveth and the law taketh away. 
Um, and what we're hearing is that it's really important to have those structural legal changes in place for things to start uh, moving uh, societally and culturally. Um, I'd love to yeah, but can hear I, from can you. I just, yeah. yeah, just say that, remember that when we make these legal changes, it's to correct something that was already legally binding, you know, so you're correcting the fact that the law had previously allowed for discrimination against trans people, or you're correcting for all kinds of things that the law actually has been the author of. And this is my problem with, with legal reform. Legal reform is essentially a conservative activity that comes later and catches up to shifts and changes that have happened in the way in which a society is thinking about groups, individuals, uh, activities, uh, law enforcement, or whatever. Just to take the example of law enforcement, you know, back in the 1930s, there were all kinds of studies done on violence in law enforcement. And in fact, there were, you know, some 14 volumes written on the topic of violence in law enforcement, but nothing changed. The law only changes things when there's a kind of social shift that suggests that this legal shift, this legal change would be welcome. So I first want to propose to people that we consider the law to be an afterthought, something that comes later and ratifies changes that have already occurred uh, elsewhere. But the other thing is in relationship to this, you know, global shift uh, in terms of the recognition or denial of rights to LGBT people like Kendall, there's, I, I just don't see how the U.S. can be uh, understood as the, uh, the entity that would police how LGBT people are treated elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, this has not, the U.S. has not been a leader in this issue. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, the, lead, the U.S. has been an imperial uh, actor who has imposed the categories of LGBT in other places where those categories are not the categories that people are using to describe themselves, their activities, their relationships, uh, and their practices. So I think that on the one hand, we need a lot less confidence in the law and an understanding that what we're trying to do is change the society as a whole, not just ask that the few you know, that these kinds of protections be extended to different people. So I think that young people are on the streets right now. They're not saying let's reform the police department. They're saying let's defund the police. Let's get rid of the police. Let's tear down structures that were literally created to ensure the legacy of white supremacy uh, and patriarchy from one generation to the next. That's the goal here, not pride, not inclusion, not recognition, not acceptance, not full humanity. Wow, okay. Suzanne, yeah, take it. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I don't actually disagree deeply with anything Jack or Kendall has said, but I, but I, I do have a different perspective on the role of law uh, because law is a construct of people and it is part of what people do to govern themselves, whether we call it law or policy or something else. And so it's, it is a thing to be dealt with and it is actually sometimes a thing that provides critical protection in it, it you know, or it can be used as a weapon, right? There's a very famous article in the in the legal scholarship world, right? The idea of law as violence, right? Law can do tremendous violence. But I think what a lot of on the ground LGBT people going to work would say is that this decision from the Supreme Court, however imperfect and catch up it is with where society is, is also a positive contribution. Not the end all, but it's a, it's a it's an affirming step from one of the institutions that is an important defining institution uh, for the US and not, and not only for the US, right? Legal systems are important in defining societies throughout the world. And maybe with, with that, Safwan, I'll, I'll, let me toss it back to you actually, if you don't mind. Um, you've done a lot of thinking about LGBTQ people in the Middle East and you work with a number of different, you've brought me to community organizations, you work with a number of different individuals and advocacy groups what is your perspective and your vantage point on all of these questions? So, I mean, I'm fascinated by hearing the different views and on Jack's uh, last comments. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself thinking, 
what comes first when you've got society and the state uh, opposing any kind of progress. Um, actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's beyond opposing any kind of progress. It's denial uh, of the existence uh, or the acceptance of anything that is different and, you know, most profoundly LGBT. And, uh, you know, I was moved, and Suzanne, I know you and I have talked about this, uh, the very sad case a couple of weeks ago uh, that I'm sure everybody has read about, uh, Sarah Hijazi, an Egyptian young woman who... Uh, uh, was amongst the uh, around 70 or so who were um, taken in by the state in Egypt uh, the night after Mashrua Layla, which is um, a music band uh, from Lebanon where the lead singer is openly gay. Uh, they performed the concert in Cairo and there were a number of people who were waving the rainbow flag and uh, uh, Sarah, there's a beautiful picture captured of her, you know, sort of feeling free, perhaps for the first time and liberated. You know, she's taken in and she's tortured and interrogated and imprisoned. And, you know, three years later, she commits suicide uh, because she could not uh, uh, take the, the aftermath, if you will, on social media. Uh, and there are countless other examples. And actually in Amman, the capital of Jordan, uh, following the... Um, the suicide of Sarah, there were rainbow flags that were painted on walls. And then there was a movement over social media demanding that the municipality of the capital city um, remove those flags, which it did. Um, and so, you know, where, where is the, the, that fine line between sort of, you know, the legal and societal, you know, the censorship and the oppression. Um, and I think, you know, if you talk to young LGBTQ plus individuals in this part of the world, uh, they tell you that they are more scared of the family and society than they are um, of, um, of the state. And uh, uh, this is something that, that uh, is, uh, you know, so, so the legal framework does not protect them, but that does not pose the greatest threat on them. And uh, I see Kendall and, and Jack uh, nodding their heads. So I'd love to get their reactions to this, uh, maybe starting with you, Jack. Um, I, well, again, um, yes, the family is a more, is a highly dangerous uh, mechanism for trans people, but you'll be waiting a long time to see the Supreme Court decision that's going to say, okay, we need to protect people from the family. You know, the, the, there are certain um, institutions that the Supreme Court is absolutely bound, almost axiomatically, to hold up and other, you know, and other uh, things that it might consider taking down. But if you think about, again, to go back to this idea about legal reform, if you think about, um, you know, marriage equality, marriage equality was way low down on the list of hopes and, and wishes for radical uh, groups back in the 70s uh, and 80s, LGBT groups. And if you think about that startling statistic that Kendall gave us about the fact that 22% of LGBT people live in poverty, probably large numbers of those people are trans um, and are people of, of color. Marriage equality does not change that percentage, not one bit, okay? Mm. And with unemployment rising in the way that it is right now, protection in the workplace is again something that won't help the millions of people who are unemployed. What we should be talking about and thinking about is how the law can be a tool to towards the goal of transforming society not just tinkering with the version of society that we have which we know is deeply discriminatory um, has uh, the same sorts of practices of white supremacy and police violence that were in place some 50 years ago okay none of that has been changed by legal reform we're looking for right. much bigger changes and yeah. i don't think that you get there through the law I'm going to come back, if I can jump in right now, to the point I made at the outset. Um, <clears throat> law, legal rights, and legal reform are necessary but not sufficient. And mm. um, I think that they're uh, necessary because over and above uh, the positive legal uh, changes that a decision like Bostic represents, it does have 
political valence and political impact. Uh, and what I heard Suzanne uh, saying is that, and, and you as well, Safwan, is that law has cultural meaning uh, and that we can use law as a political tool to uh, pursue social and institutional change. So if we think about the politics of law, uh, the, the chief significance of the law and the decision, uh, like the decision we got from the Supreme Court in this case, is that it creates a space in which people can start to talk about and through talking about to imagine themselves in relationship to one another in a different way. Right? So I, I think that there is a value uh, to rights discourse and to law, both as an institution and as an ideology that we should not minimize or dismiss. At the same time, uh, the law cannot possibly achieve uh, the transformational change that I believe is necessary uh, to uh, uh, create a society uh, in which uh, sexual difference and gender identity difference is not merely tolerated, but seen as an affirmative, uh, positive social good, right? Um, and so, of course, it makes a difference uh, for activists and, and people who aren't activists who are living in Russia or in Nigeria or in um, Uganda or in Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, that they don't have uh, laws that say uh, clearly and, and firmly that the rights of LGBTQ people and the dignity of LGBTQ people uh, is recognized and accorded protection. Uh, I, want, I, I would be the last person to, uh, to, 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 to deny that the absence of legal protection in those countries doesn't matter. Uh, but it's also important um, to, uh, to emphasize at the same time uh, the point that I started out making. Law is necessary, right? But it's insufficient. It's not sufficient. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so with that, with that premise, uh, if you will, I'm picking up some questions from uh, our audience and some great questions there. And you know, one that I'd like to um, address now because it's really very relevant to what you just said, Kendall. Um, what would have happened if the ruling? Uh, went in the other direction, which is what we all were dreading and expecting. And we were uh, surprised, and, and Jack had comments about that, uh, that surprise element. What would have been the impact? And maybe as a follow-up to that, what do we expect in terms of a backlash? Um, and uh, maybe that can lead us into thinking about what happens if, God forbid, uh, Trump is re-elected. So who'd like to take that one? <laughs> I'd like Suzanne? to begin if you, if you don't mind and then, and then turn it over to others. And I, I think it's a great question and, and to me affirms why this matters. And not the only reason why this matters, but one of the reasons why these decisions matter. Right? If this had gone the other way, what would have been the impact? I mean, as a practical matter, this would have meant that federal law that prohibits employment discrimination would not protect LGBT people at work, right? Federal law being the law that covers the 50 states, then there are some states that do have protections, but at the national level, we wouldn't have those protections. It would also, it doesn't mean that they would never happen. There's been a, a, a bill called the Equality Act that's been sitting in the US Congress in various forms for decades now, trying to put those protections into our, into our statutes. Um, those, those fights would continue. Uh, but, it, but the problem would, would be twofold, right? One would, would be the absence of those protections, and two would be the signal that, that the, a, a negative decision sends, which is, gets back to the signaling effect of law that we were just talking about. Law sends a very powerful signal about what society 
through its formal parts, right, through the institutions that make up the government, thinks about a particular group, a group of people or a particular set of issues. And this would have been a very powerful signal that LGBT people are, at least in some sense, outside of law. And outside of law, as Kendall pointed out earlier, a particular kind of law related to employment that, is, that affects many, many, many people. Not everybody, mm. as Jack pointed out, but many, many. Mm. So, um, so, so, I th so I think that this is an important question for us. The, the second piece I wanted to point out is that law reform efforts are never in a vacuum, and they're, meaning that they don't ever happen outside of other kinds of societal advocacy, right? If mm -hmm. one were to just go to a decision maker, whether a court or a legislator and say, I want you to pass this thing, provide protections to this group of people or eliminate that barrier. It won't go anywhere unless there are, unless there, there are the, what I think of as the receptors created. Mm -hmm. So the decision makers might think, oh, this is a reasonable argument. This isn't off the wall, right? 30 years ago, I don't think we would have gotten this decision from the court. It would have been the correct decision theoretically and analytically, but this is a decision that comes in a very different environment, which gets us to this question of chicken and egg and which is, is the law first or is culture first? I think each influences each other. I, I think of it more as a combined chicken right. and egg sandwich, if you will, or a vegan chicken and egg sandwich, <laughs> or, or at least a sort of a synergy. But I, I would turn it back over to Jack for your, for your thoughts on this, because I suspect you don't entirely agree. Yeah, no, I don't, and I just don't entirely agree. I mean, what would have happened if this hadn't passed? Would it be in the same as it was before it passed? You know, I mean, this is a this is a correction. It's not an advance. It's not propulsive. It's saying uh, let's take something that was written in 1964 and extend it. So it's conservative. This is a conservative understanding uh, of change, and it's not just a matter of like, you know which thing influences which thing. It's a matter of thinking about how uh, the law works and why, and this is what radical groups, and it's wrong to separate Black Lives Matter out from LGBT activism. Many of the people on the streets are absolutely engaged with all of these projects at, at once. And they are, what they're saying is, for example, that pride is not uh, you know, this radical event, but it often has been a place where policemen have been invited in as participants. They now wear little pride flags on their helmets. Um, stores and businesses are part of these pride ma marches. Pride is a vector for capital for the most part um and what 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 is the alternative to this the alternative to this is arguing for a broad scale movement who has in its sights not legal reform but abolition the abolition uh of prisons um the abolition of you know all structures of inequality in housing and in education now if those kinds of abolitional goals were to be meet were to be met you would not need these protections. You need these protections in the law precisely because we live in a shitty society uh, that is rife with white supremacy and homophobia. So can, you can't change that with a legal reform. What you need is something much broader. Right. Well, so, again, it, go ahead, Kendall. Necessary. Um, so I, I want to disagree, actually, um, with, with my friend and colleague, uh, Jack, because I think um, again, thinking politically, it's important um, to be clear about what just happened. Uh, I don't think this opinion um, is conservative in a political sense. As Jack was saying, uh, it's framed in terms of individuals and individual rights. So it is um, classically liberal, if you will, uh, and it offers a um, a liberal legal vision of how social change can happen. Um, and at this particular moment, again, thinking and speaking politically, I'll take that because we're living in this country uh, and in many other places around the world uh, at a profoundly, uh, in a profoundly anti-liberal moment anti-liberal moment. And um, it, that means that it is given to us, those of us who, who, who view ourselves as radical, 
uh, to uh, defend and to try to protect the, the liberal democratic discourse that makes even a modest conservative decision like Bostick possible. Because if we lose that, all the larger transformative goals that Jack has spelled out will be that much more difficult. So for me, um, had the court decided this another way, the setback wouldn't have been that we would have been in the same position that we were in before, but that we would have been worse off. Uh, because as, as a practical matter, um, we would have had, as Suzanne was saying, to wage state by state legislative or court campaigns, um, or we would have been forced to try to go back to uh, the Congress to persuade a majority of the members of Congress to enact a bill uh, that right now is stalled. So as a, as a, a, a practical matter of uh, political um, activism, I think it's clear uh, that we would have been worse off without uh, the Bostic decision. Now that we have the decision, it seems to me uh, that it does create some space, perhaps not as much space as, as, as we need or um, as we might have hoped for if, for example, the court had spoken more forthrightly and in a more substantive way about uh, sexuality uh, and about transgender identity, which the opinion does not do uh, by focusing uh, solely on sex. But we have this decision and it allows us now to devote resources that we otherwise would have been forced to expend on um, anti-discrimination uh, protection, seeking anti-discrimination protection in the employment context to focus precisely on some of these issues uh, that Jack has just raised. Like for, uh, for example, uh, the criminalization of um, gay, lesbian, uh, and transgender people, the policing of our communities, uh, the discriminatory targeting, the harassment, and the violence that we suffer at the hands of the state, uh, which, by the way, is linked to these questions of economic justice when one looks just to take um, one example at the ways in which uh, LBGTQ businesses like bars and clubs um, and uh, LGBTQ people like sex workers are targeted by the police in many places in this country for the kinds of um, discriminatory targeting and harassment, um, exploitation, and even violence that I've pointed out. Um, the other thing that uh, a decision like Bostock makes possible now uh, that we can add it to the other gains that we've made um, is it frees up some space uh, for us to work um, on laws that ban conversion therapy, or uh, to seek laws that legalize adoption, to address the barriers to um, immigration, uh, and to uh, address in a specific targeted way that the whole movement can get behind uh, the, the unique condition uh, that transgender people are in uh, with respect to their being really the target both of state violence and of the kinds of violences, the social violence uh, that we were talking about earlier. So um, I know I sound like I'm trying to um, split the difference uh, between Jack and Suzanne, uh, but I do want to recognize- and That's not a bad thing. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, yeah, that's my job on yeah. the, but I think it, it, it's also, um, it's also my, 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 my position, my substantive yeah. position. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so can I jump in in these last few minutes of the discussion and maybe toss a question back to each of the three of you, if you don't mind, Stefan, with just Sure. No, I don't mind at all. And maybe, I mean, there are a couple of uh, just observations I want to make about uh, some of the questions and maybe throw them in. Would you rather I do that after? Uh, you, it's your show. You, you, you go ahead and then... <laughs> it's our show. It's our and show. Our, our no, show. I mean, I'll, I'll end yeah. on these questions about pride. No, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by some of the questions and comments. So we have Yimo from Beijing and Leila from Amman. Uh, Yimo is trans um, and, um, you know, is, is, is eager. I mean, I'm not sure that we can address these questions, but, you know, as a trans man um, from Beijing, uh, he's concerned with uh, sort of, you know, what resources are available uh, 
um, in China, uh, what impact, you know, he's looking for uh, sort of impact in China of what's here. Uh, Leila is terrified of coming out in society, but she wants to contribute to social change. And an anonymous uh, uh, audience member is, is asking, you know, where do we go from here? Okay, and, and you know, everybody's looking at it sort of um, looking for, for resourcefulness. Uh, there are a number of questions that talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And I think, you know, we've talked about this, uh, but perhaps in the closing, this is something that can uh, come back to this, uh, the intersectionality, if you will, in the um, movement for social rights. And then another, just an observation, which I thought uh, was really important, came up in the couple of comments. Uh, let's not forget that much of the regressive laws that exist in many parts of the world uh, were imposed by colonial powers. <laughs> you know, whether it is the Brits in certain parts of the world, uh, and, uh, you know, even some of it was sort of uh, American uh, imperialism um, that brought that uh, around. So I just wanted, Suzanne, to recognize those comments and uh, happy to go to you now for your closing questions. <laughs> I think this, this, those comments actually capture the array of challenges, right? Because the issues we're talking about range from the deeply personal individual I don't want to put my name in connection with this discussion. I don't, can't let anybody know my identity because I fear for my life. To the, what do we do? What are the set of, sets of social resources, legal resources, state resources, NGO resources at the local, state, national level to what do we want to be as a society, right? I mean, these are, these are all of the questions embedded. And I, I think the, the, point in some ways of, of the connection as, as some of the comments it sounds like raised between the Black Lives Matter movement, LGBTQ movement, other social movements is these are all movements that are sometimes in sync and sometimes not, hopefully more in sync now than, than ever, um, envisioning a different society, a different kind of society in which all people are free to live with dignity and with the means to not only survive, but to, but to live a, a life that is meaningful to them. And that's, I think, what we're wrestling over. You're hearing different sets of strategies about how to get there, but I, I think we probably all, I'm going to go out on a limb here, share a view that, that, that's, that that's one of our, one of our ultimate goals. Yeah. Uh, so the question, the, and the, I, I guess turning it over, uh, Jack, to you, and then Kendall, to you for last comments, the overlay that, that I wanted to add is back to the question of pride, which is in the title of today's discussion. Uh, because one can certainly describe this as a vector of capitalism or a vector of capital or a, a vector of commercialism. And it, and it has been all of these things. And at the same time, every year on Pride, including this year when I was tuning in to some of the world pride that happened for 24 hours online, you know, it is something that is deeply meaningful to LGBTQ plus people who often grow up not knowing anybody like them or only hearing the negative. And there's something profound, I think, profound and restorative to dignity of, of, about hearing other people say, you can be proud of who you are. And there is this idea of pride in, in not only the, the individual, but in the, in the vision of society that, that, is, that we bring forward when we insist on the dignity of all. Um, so so I, I would just toss that general set of questions and ideas over Jeff to you to start and then Kendall for you to to uh, to finish. I think Safwan would say very briefly since we're probably close to time. Yes. Yes. Okay. Just very briefly. I'm happy that uh, people can, <clears throat> you know, express themselves in these events and I've been to my share of pride and but at the end of the day, I think that we have to be very careful about the ruses of both capital and the law that seem to be offering something, but are in fact simply hardening systems of exclusion and oppression. And that I believe is what goes on when we focus too vigorously on something like pride and are not concerned about homelessness uh, among 
uh, queer and trans youth. Um, but I also think when we're celebrating a decision like this from the Supreme Court and not noticing that, as even the New York Times reported today, this Supreme Court has ruled in incredibly um, positive ways on all kinds of uh, decisions that uh, give huge leverage to corporations and to the wealthy. And so at the end of the day, I personally want to uh, encourage people to think beyond the law and beyond pride um, and to think about property relations as one of the more most important factors for thinking about how to structure uh, change. Change through abolition, change through dismantling this society and the way in which it uh, decides who matters and who doesn't, um, and um, yeah, and a much a much more radical framework for transformation. That's great, thank you, Kendall. I want to bite off the piece of the, the the issue which has been raised in several questions about connections between um, Black Lives Matter and the protests that we've seen the last few weeks in the streets. Um, and LBGTQ politics. At the center of the Black Lives Matter movement is an important uh, shift from an understanding of the nature of the challenges that Black people in the United States face uh, from a civil rights uh, and, and indeed a, a, a rights, legal rights model to a human rights model. Right? So if you go on the, the, the platform of the movement uh, for Black Lives, uh, you will see that in each instance, the concrete policy demands that are made in that platform reflect a commitment to a vision of Black liberation that is grounded in the importance uh, and the centering of human rights and of human rights culture. And so for me, if uh, we want to take a lesson from the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, we should start thinking beyond the civil rights paradigm, if you will, uh, that underwrites each of the legal decisions that uh, have led to the Bostic opinion and to center this idea of a queer human rights culture. And this is for people, particularly in the case of transgender people, who aren't even considered by virtue of uh, their location in the, the binary gender system to even be human. Right? Since uh, in, in our cultures, uh, recognition of one's gender identity in many ways precedes or is a foundation for one's recognition of one's humanity. So what would it mean uh, to build a queer human rights culture? Well, I think um, there, 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 there are two things. One, we need to move from mere recognition, which is what Jack has been saying, to look at the structural issues and the ways in which our possibilities for living out our, our full humanity are a function not just of law, but of all these other economic and social issues that Jack has raised. Um, equally fundamental, it seems to me, is uh, we need to recognize as the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been led largely um, by queer and transgender people in the Black community has taught us race, sexuality, uh, transgender identity, and the political movements that have emerged on the basis of uh, each of those identities are all coalitional. They're all coalitional. Race is a coalition, sexuality is a coalition, and gender is a coalition. And the Black Lives Matter movement has connected the pursuit of Black freedom in the United States, uh, not only to other movements in other parts of the world, but to sexuality movements, transgender movements, uh, and the like. Sadly, uh, we have not seen the same kind of expansive vision in the LBGTQ movement in the United States. Racial justice has not been at the center of that movement's agenda. And I would put it to you uh, that the linked fates, as one scholar uh, put it, the linked fate of LGBTQ people and black people, um, some black people are LGBTQ and some LGBTQ people are people are black and, and, and um, members of other people of color uh, uh, groups. 
until we are willing to work coalitionally mm -hmm. uh, and to understand the work that we do within each of our movements as coalitional work, we will not see the secure legal uh, achievements nor the broader social achievements. I mean, it's worth remarking uh, that some 60 years after the civil rights revolution, black people are still being gunned down by police in the streets. Right? Right. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's worth asking, do LBGTQ people have the same future to look forward to? Um, right. The only way we can avoid that future, I think, is by recognizing uh, the commonality of the struggles that each of us is engaged in. Uh, and the codependence, if you will, the interdependence of each of those struggles for human freedom on one another. Uh, and there are models for that work. Uh, and we live at a moment when I think our future depends on our willingness to enlarge the territory of our vision of the nature of the problems we face, uh, of the injustices we face, and on uh, the nature of the battles and the struggles uh, that we're going to have to wage uh, if we are going uh, to change the, the culture uh, which, which reproduces these structures of injustice for people of color and for sexual and gender minorities. I almost don't want to say anything because what you have said is so profound and so articulate and so beautiful. Um, and I really hope that people paid attention um, to every idea that has been shared by all, all of us, by all of you um, throughout. Um, I think, you know, that note of hope, that note of uh, future and forward looking um, um, thinking is really what's important. And as I, you know, again, look at the audience and look at their comments, um, you know, I feel it is incumbent upon us to continue to do all the work that we're doing in the law, in society, in academia, um, outside of it, uh, to ensure that there is a far more equitable world uh, for the generations to come. And uh, Kendall, I mean, you know, to, to what you were saying, I would say across all of those causes and across all of humanity, because, uh, you know, the, the, these things are just so incredibly common uh, across the world. And just, you know, for the same reasons that we see people in Paris identifying with police brutality against black individuals in France, uh, they relate with what happened to George Floyd uh, the same is true, I think, across uh, the LGBTQ plus communities and everything else. So I think, you know, coming together and continuing to work on all of those things. And, you know, I thank you because I am uh, a novice uh, compared to the three of you uh, who have really spent so much of your lives and so much of your careers, um, you know, studying, working on this, teaching it, and very, very importantly, uh, being activists in that domain. Suzanne, do you want to say anything to close? <laughs> Thank you. I echo exactly, Stefan, what you said. It is, and I think, you know, our goal in having this conversation today was to, to be at a, you know, sort of an imaginary dinner table together. Yeah. And the only thing I wish was that we had more hours that we would have at a dinner together to continue the conversation including the four of us and including everybody who has joined the chat and has shared your very important yep. ideas and thoughts. And we'll look forward to more conversation going forward. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. So before we go, I uh, want us to commit collectively to, the, uh, to two things. One is we will be back together on this virtual platform and we'll bring in other um, interlocutors because I think that there's great, great interest and great appetite uh, for further discussion around these issues. So let's commit to, to doing this and doing it more often. And then uh, the second thing is that when we're all back in New York and the circumstances allow it, that we actually have a, a real dinner around the dinner table and continue this conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank right. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks Thank to you. all of our audience members. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.